There we go. Because I was trying to, um, it, it was suggested that that for you, because um, otherwise I was going to have you do like a study guide kind of thing, but I think practice questions probably serve you better. I just remembered another question I had. Oh, yeah. Uh, if we're going to retake that test, um, do you kind of have a prediction of what, what date we might do it? Yeah, I'm thinking Thursday or Friday next week, because then we'll be through the care of children as well, and then people can um, decide um, what they want to do. So I was thinking um, Thursday, maybe for maternal newborn, and Friday for um, uh, care of children. Okay, cool. If, if that sounds good. And, um, and I do have the, once it's nice now, I don't have to, I don't have to call and say, add the retake, retest it automatically after, um, after you take it, it pops up automatically, which is nice. So, um, so we have that available, but I'll post an announcement because we'll know more after um, Monday. So, um, I mean, I'm hoping obviously everybody will do great. The review will help so much. Um, okay, right, so we're gonna get you through this. So, um, oops, it's Friday, isn't it? <laughs> Here we go. Um, okay, so basically this is a review through the ATI, um, through the ATI books. So, um, we have to go way back in the way back machine, right? And remember family centered nursing care. But I would think that, um, do you guys feel like you've seen that? It's been, it's been difficult, I think. You know, we have to think about the whole semester. Um, I know the COVID thing's kind of been weird because family hasn't really been allowed in the hospital, right? Um, but hopefully, you know, looking at parenting styles, composition, what types of families. Um, I try to put key points or things to know um, on the left side of the screen for you guys, because you could basically use the um, PowerPoint as um, as a study guide if you want. You guys know how to print out PowerPoints, right? You can do it like a three uh, the three slide view that you can take notes on, kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. And then um, I did also post it um, on the home page if you guys want to open it up and and you know do whatever while we're we're doing this. Um, so the question is, um, oh, so do, do you want me to call on people like you guys were doing before? Do you want to just answer what's going to help you with the um, with the questions? Because otherwise, I'll just kind of go down my line of people that show on my screen. We could do it as a group. Yeah, as a group. You want to do it as a group? Okay. Yeah. Um, is that okay with other other people? Yes. Because sometimes it takes a while for people to read the question. So, um, okay, so the nur a nurse is performing a family assessment and what should be included in that family assessment and that uh, select all that apply. And I try to put a lot of select all that apply in here so that you guys have, pra we can practice that. Because I know select all that apply is everybody's favorite question. All of them? Almost. Not number C. I mean, not C. Not C. Not C. Not C. I don't even think it's A. So if somebody thinks it's A, why do you, why do you think it's A? I will tell you that C, you don't include C, right? Because that's physical growth. Mm -hmm. But why would you want to include A, the medical history? Oh, I said I didn't want to include A, Ms. Hollinger. Right, but you, you do include A in a family assessment. It would okay. be to know like how often they've been in the hospital like previously or how much they've had to deal with so far. Right. Or they have like any um, hereditary diseases or that run in the family. Yeah, for sure. Um, oh, thanks, Chaley. Chaley just posted in the, in the chat. Um, right, because there could be genetic things, there could be things going on that help, or um, 
like say the father has a chronic illness or something, right? That's medical history and that, that plays into the family dynamic and stress and all that kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? So uh, the only one, oh, you guys are so good, look at you. I'm sorry, I keep seeing chats and I don't know if it's a question for me or not, um, right? So the correct answer is that the nurse is going to include A, B, D, and E. Okay, all right. Let's see if we can move that. Okay, physical assessment, right? So you're gonna have to go back and look at those um, those checklists, um, you know, that for your assessments. Go back and look at the um, the BMI growth charts, um, and then I did notice like they have the reflexes for the infants. Um, there is a thing on cranial nerves. One of the things in when I'm preparing this, like there is so much information and they're only going to ask you 70 questions. So I hesitate to say, well, you should really know this because I have no idea what they're going to ask you. I just mm -hmm. know from, you know, from experience that they tend to ask certain things or not, or like what's important. So generally speaking, vital signs, the growth charts, the, the reflexes, um, and as we go through health promotion for each age group, like what physically they can do, you know, as, as they get older. So our question is, the nurse is checking vital signs for a three-year-old during a well-child visit. Which findings should the nurse report to the provider? Um, Heart rate. See. Oh. So I have a C. Yeah, I agree with that one. Because yeah, one of those is one of those is out of range, right? So, yeah. are, what about the temp? Are we concerned about the temp? No, that's within range. Not really. It's it's you know yeah it's yeah. And then so I think what the question comes down to is the is the heart rate too high? Mm -hmm. No, it's not. Is it not? Is the respiratory rate too high? Where, yeah. where would, what's the upper limit for where you'd want to see the respiratory rate? Twenty five. Like about 24, 25, somewhere in there, yes. So the respiratory rate is a little high. And then blood pressure um, is fine. The blood pressure, that blood pressure is fine for a three-year-old. So the correct answer is C, the respiratory rate is a little bit high. So if you can think, oh, well, respiratory rate really should be 24, then you pretty much know that's your, that's your answer. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, don't worry about this. I was going to have you guys do the um, poll everywhere, but that's a pain in the butt and it's Friday. So we'll just forget that. Um, so neuro assessment, there are things on um, the cranial nerves. So, um, you know, go back and review those. Um, so there's a neurological assessment on an adolescent, which response should the nurse um, expect the adolescent to exhibit when assessing the trigeminal nerve? Ooh. Um, and it is actually a select all that apply. Sorry, I don't think I wrote that on there. Um, so what do you, where, what, if we're talking trigeminal? Anybody, no, nobody probably remembers that. Maybe people do. You tell me what you think. So I'm guessing maybe A and C. Okay, we have an A and C. Another A. You guys don't have, I mean, you can get on if you want, you don't have to. Is there anything that you can for sure, um, that you know it's not? The smell. E. Yeah, being, yeah, the um, sour taste and the smell. And so that leaves you with the teeth and the detecting touch on the, on the face. And so then the other thing that you're really thinking about, okay, is it, is it the eyes? Is it looking down and in with the no. eyes? I thought D was ocular motor, right? Is that not? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I'm amazed that you know that and congratulations because <laughs> I can never remember them. Um, so the correct answer would be A, which is clenching your teeth together. 
and um, C, the detecting the facial touches with the eyes closed. Because you can kind of pair them like the smell and the taste, kind of those are sensorial. And then the, um, um, and looking down is, is a different one. So the teeth, like it's movement, right? Trigeminal is like movement of the, on the face, like the jaw, the, the cheeks, that kind of thing. To the next one. Okay, so now we're going to go through health promotion um, for infants, toddlers, school age, that kind of thing. Um, so ATI is really nice in that it sort of sets the, um, the chapter up for you and it's a lot of the same, the same thing. So, you know, what do you expect from an infant? You need to know like head circumference. Um, when does the weight double? When does it triple? Um, how is the physical development supposed to go? You need to know um, like the age appropriate activities, what kind of, um, uh, you know, play activities would, would be good for the child. Um, when can they sit? When can they roll over, right? And I think there's tables, pretty sure there's a table in each of those chapters. Um, and then safety, like car seats, immunizations, um, nutrition, other safety things, like the, um, um, you know, like putting a gate at the top of the stairs, that kind of stuff. And then um, Piaget and Erickson. There's generally a question about that. So our question is, the nurse is providing education about introducing new foods to the guardians of a four-month-old infant. Um, so a little anticipatory guidance there, because when would you want to start introducing new foods? Surely at six months. Six months, yeah. Um, the nurse should recommend that the caregiver introduce which of the of the foods first? B. B. I'm hearing B. 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 Is B is a boy. <laughs> so it is the answer is B. You want to start with the iron fortified cereals because they need the um, the iron fortification, um, and that's generally the first the first food. I will tell you that many times people will start with vegetables. Um, fruits, not so much because they tend to be sweeter, uh, um, but when looking at um, nutrition, it's usually the iron fortified cereals that you wanna do first. So that's a question where experience may or may not be helpful to you. So just keep that, keep that in mind. Um, Okay, so we have the nurse is doing a, I think I only have one more of these. Nurse is conducting the well baby visit for the four month old, which immunizations are they going to administer? Select all that apply. Polio. So yeah, we're gonna do polio. Mococcal and rotavirus. Yeah. Rotavirus. Uh, so polio, rotavirus, and pneumococcal. Yes. Okay. What are ones, what could you, um, what can you take out right away when you're looking at the question? Like, what can you narrow it down to? MMR. Right, you're going to take out MMR. And and which other one? And varicella. Pardon? Yeah, the MMR and varicella you're going to take out. So then you're like, okay, polio, pneumococcal, and rotavi rotavirus. So pretty much polio and rotavirus for sure, right? Those are usually your two, four, six month ones. So for, for me, the pneumococcal would have been sort of the outlier that I would have to think about. I don't know if that's your guys' pro thought process. I'm trying to think, you know, like how I would answer the question. Um, so the correct answer is polio, um, pneumococcal, and rotavirus. Right, and it's also like the MMR and varicella, they're the same type, right? They're the live virus or, yeah, so you don't wanna, um, and when do we give that? When do we do the MMR and the um, varicella? Usually 12 months. We do that at delivery um, after? No, the MMR? Usually it's 12 months, like at their uh, one year physical? Yeah, like 12, it, 12 to 15 months oh, is, is the range, yeah. And those, are those IM or sub Q? Sub Q. Sub Q. Sub Q, right? Because they're it's a whole, they're a whole different ball game. Right? Okay, health promotion of toddlers. So it's um 
not, I'm going to try and not repeat, but it's the same thing, right? You have to know all the physical measurements, the Piaget, Erickson, all that. So nurses assessing a two and a half year old toddler at a well child visit, which finding should the nurse report to the provider? Height increased by three inches in the past year. Head circumference exceeds the chest circumference. Interior and posterior fontanelles are closed. Current weight equals four times the birth weight. I think B. I think B too. So I have a couple Bs. Anybody else want to weigh in? Current weight equals four times birth. So why, um, why, what made you um, lean towards B? Those of you that think uh, it's B. Well, I'm thinking it's because it's a two and a half year old. I mean, their chest is actually pretty well developed, but I'm thinking if the head is, you know, the circumference is bigger than that, there's, then that is a, there's problem. a problem. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. And I think, so what did you get it down to B and which other one? Or did, where was B the one that's, that stuck out? For me, it was B who that stuck out. Okay, good. I think maybe B and, and D, like if you're not quite sure, like we know um, by six months, the birth weight doubles and by one year it triples, but we don't really talk about, well, where's it supposed to be at two and a half years old, but it is four times, it's about approximately four times the birth weight. All right, preschoolers, same thing. New question. A nurse is caring for a preschool age child who expresses the need to leave, uh, leave the hospital um, because their doll is scared to be at home alone. Which characteristic of preoperational thought is the child exhibiting? Egocentrism, centration, animism, or magical thinking? C. 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 D. Ooh, I got a bunch, nice. I don't hear A, right? Not egocentrism, right? Um, centration is a little bit like egocentrism, but not quite the same thing. We, we have a doll that's scared to be at home alone. So isn't that magical thinking because you're creating a persona for the doll as being alive? It is, except- But I thought it's like the you animate. Of, what is the definition of animism? It's when you um, make something come to life. You're animating yes, when you, the inanimate Yes, when you have object. an inanimate object come to life. So the correct answer is C. Because you're giving the doll that's an inanimate, they're giving the doll that's an inanimate object characteristics of a, of a real person. And that's why it's the better choice than magical thinking. Because I think you could get it down to C and D. Those would probably be your two choices, right? When you get it down to two. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Okay. Helps to read all the answers too. Yeah, I, you know, I actually, because I, all these questions, I took, I did them. I did the practice questions in, in ATI. And, um, and I will tell you, I did not get them all, <laughs> all correct. Mostly because I didn't read all my answer choices. <laughs> or read the entire question the right way. Okay, school-age children, same thing. Um, nurses providing education about age-appropriate activities. Um, oh, that's, that's how they worded that question. Now I'm like, oh, the caregivers are gonna do these things? No, it's what is the six-year-old gonna do? Um, which activities should the nurse include in the teaching? So basically the question is asking you, what would you expect a six-year-old child to be able to do? What's a, what's and what's an activity for them that would be appropriate? B or A? D. C. A. 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 D. D. I knew somebody was going to say D. A B C D. There you go. Okay. So when should? 
children start joining competitive sports according to growth and development theory, not according to when the parents want to start coaching them. <laughs> Isn't it like school age? Like teenage? Yeah. But it's not a six year, so school age covers like what, six to 12? Yeah. yeah. A lot of time in there, right? So competitive sports is generally nine to 12 years yeah. old. Right. Of course, we see people in t-ball and soccer at four and six. Um, it's not supposed to be competitive. It's supposed to be learning to play the sport. Parents make it competitive. Um, so D is not the correct answer. And so then you're left for a six-year-old solving jigsaw puzzles, playing card games, or jumping rope. Um, solving jigsaw puzzles is... Um, it doesn't tell you that it's like the big ones, like the big chunky puzzles, right? And that's really um, something that's going to keep them sitting and not, and, and it's kind of difficult for them at that age. Um, for me personally, I was down to A and B, jumping rope and playing card games. And then so when you're thinking about an appropriate activity for a six-year-old, jumping rope would be that activity. So A would be the correct answer. And I keep having bio reactions as I take all these questions. Like, ah. um, I don't have a question for adolescents, sorry. I'll find one and put one in. Um, but just to know that again, the differences, things like sexual identity is something new that, that comes into that different age appropriate um, activities for the adolescent. Um, and then for safe administration of medications, there's a couple that I don't have questions for. I can go back and put some in. But again, you guys know this. You guys have been doing, you know, giving medication. So you know how, you know, what's the best way to, you're going to do your safe dose calculation. They may have a math problem in there. I don't know for sure. Um, but safe dose. And then, you know, how do you administer an oral medication to a child? How do you administer an optic? Like, do you know the difference, right? Optic versus otic? Right? Optic is your, it's going in your eyes, and otic ear. is going in your ear. Um, and so um, if the child is three years or under and you're giving them an ear medication, what are you doing with the pinna of the ear? Down and back. Down and back. Down and back. And do you guys have a way that you remember that? Um, no. Or do you just remember it? For a child, I just say the D I associated with down. Yep, that was going to be my hint. The child down. Um, nasal aerosol, yeah. So, um, and then just be aware that for IVs, it's not just a peripheral. Like we've seen several children with pick lines. Um, they can also have um, central venous access uh, devices, C beds. And then pain management, so perception. Um, what do we have? Who had the patient? I can't remember that was having the pain, and we had to do the we did the ibuprofen, and then we did the Tylenol right before she left. That was me. That was you, Brittany, right? So, so I was thinking about that patient. I'm like, she didn't look like she was a six out of ten. No. Right, Brittany. She was yeah. not that she was in pain but she seemed like she was fine until i showed her the scale and then she would say six and you use the um faces scale yeah right and so you guys need to know the difference for the flack and the faces like which scales are appropriate for um for different ages right and so um did you go back in half an hour or an hour to reassess half an hour Half an hour. And was, I think, was it a five or was it still a six? It was a five. And then I went in like an hour after and it went to a six again. Right. And so then um, we actually advocated to, the Tylenol was rectal, I think. Was it a suppository? Yeah, it was suppository. And so then they, um, they called the doctor to get a, a PO um, elixir. So that was good. Um, but knowing to you know, knowing how to, which scales to use is going to be really important. Um, and also probably non-pharmacological non techniques. Um, hospitalization, illness and play, um, 
you know, the stages, different developmental um, stages, the development impact on the child and the family as well. Um, you know, interventions like setting expectations, the routines, the, the children really thrive more on, um, you know, routines. Um, if you can do some um, different types of play, it's um, need to look at the content, the character of it, the functions like parallel play, um, like know those definitions of the different types of play um, and different perceptions. The stages is the, um, the protest, despair. Remember that from way back, there were stages, protest, despair, that's, that's what they're, um, that's what this part is asking about. Um, death and dying, so you know the different um, the different types of grief, um, anticipatory, complicated, and then how um, like how according to your developmental stage, how do you view death? So in other words, how does a um, toddler understand death versus how does an adolescent understand death? Does that make sense? You guys remember that? Yeah. Yeah, like toddlers, uh, they're gonna come yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. And then palliative care, care for the grieving family, and then how to take care take care of ourselves. Um, so one of the things about ATI is that when you start to go through the, the different um, body systems, um, they, they go by diagnoses rather than concepts. So it's kind of difficult to, I think with ATI to mesh the two, like put them together. Um, so I tried to do that a little bit, but I probably wasn't very successful. But I'm, my hope for you all by the end of the semester is that you can see um, the different concepts. Like you know what to look for respiratory. You know what respiratory distress looks like. You know if somebody isn't perfusing well, regardless of what the medical diagnosis is. And so that you can then know what nursing care to provide. Um, so going back to neuro disorders, um, like meningitis, right? And, and what are you going to see? It's, it's assessment. What are you going to see? What is the patient going to look like? And then what interventions are you going to do um, for that patient? So the, the findings, remember we had videos on Brzezinski's and Koenig's sign. What do you need to know about uh, lumbar puncture, right? How do you position the patient? Uh, the lab test, what is the difference if, the, um, if it's bacterial versus viral meningitis? What kind of care um, and what's the cerebrospinal fluid going to look like? What are the different medications? What happens if the increased inner, if the meningitis doesn't, isn't addressed, then you get increased intracranial pressure. What does that look like in an infant? What does that look like in a school age child? And then um, Rye syndrome, again, physical assessment. What are you going to see? What are you going to, you know, what nursing interventions are you going to do? And then education. I'm trying to get key points there, hopefully. Uh, seizures, again, this is just a, a little list of like knowing the differences, the generalized versus the partial, um, and then different diagnostic procedures. And um, we had uh, a patient that was on seizure precautions. I can't remember which student it was, um, but but they should have had seizure precautions and they didn't. And so the student like was like, there's, there's no padding, there's nothing, this, there's no suction. So, um, and so the students went ahead and, and did that, which was great. Uh, and then according to ATI, it does say protect from injury, turn them on their side, uh, you know, like how long is the seizure? What does it look like? All those types of things, taking the notes. And then, um, and then the post-seizure positioning and the post-ictal state, that kind of thing. And then the different medications that could be administered. And then different complications like the developmental delay. Status ep epilepticus, right? Those are seizures that continue for 30 minutes or longer. Head injury, different, it asks you the different types of fractures, right? So knowing the different types of fractures, knowing how to do the preventative, the preventive education, the health promotion, how to you know, make sure the child's wearing a helmet, those types of things. What you might find if there is a skull fracture, um, know the difference between the um, flexion extension, decorticate, decerebrate um, positioning, because it means depending on how they 
our position, it means it's a different part of the brain that's been affected. Um, what else? Different medications like mannitol, AEDs is your anti-epileptic drugs, just by the way, and ABX is my abbreviation for antibiotics, so I don't have to spell it out. Uh, and then complications, right? Hematomas, hemorrhage, edema, brain herniation, scary stuff. I know, this is cognitive and sensory overload impairment for the slide. Uh, ha ha. Everybody's still awake? Yeah, that was a good okay. one. Good, thank you. Just just checking. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, looking at visual impairments, there could potentially be questions about, um, you know, myopia, hyperopia, opia. A lot of times with the strabismus, they'll ask you, um, there could be a question on which side does the patch go on, the affected eye or the not affected eye? And what, what, what would the answer for that be? Non-affected eye to make the... Non-affected eye. Right, you patch the non-affected eye to make the affected eye work, right, to do, to do the work. And again, I don't know if that'll be on there. I just know that's a question that often is asked. And then being able to do the, the screening and things that you're screening for. Um, hearing impairments, we, I know we talked about that in, in clinical and in, in my group anyway, but you, to know the difference between conductive and sensory neural and how you how that might um, how you might notice that depending on the developmental level. <clears throat> like you're probably not going to notice anything in a newborn, which is why we do newborn hearing screening. But if it's a toddler, um, they're not going to turn to their name. They're, they're things that they're not, you know, you have a loud noise, they're not going to turn their head, things like that. And then you can um, cochlear implants are a thing, which is kind of cool. And then you could also have potentially delayed growth and development if you didn't catch on that there was an impairment. And then um, Down syndrome, I know we went over that in, um, in lecture. So looking at the alpha feta protein as a marker, looking at the nuchal um, fold thickness, um, complications. Okay. So this was an interesting chapter when I was looking at it because it doesn't really talk about specific disease process is talking about oxygenation, right? And inhalation hair therapy to like open up the airways. So I thought that was, um, I thought that was pretty good. So pulse oximetry, right? Everybody's had a patient with a pulse ox, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> and so, you know, the, sat the saturation starts to go down. What do you do? Like you're sitting at the nurse's station and the alarm goes off on the monitor. And so you get up to like the saturation's 80%. And so what, what do you, what do you do? You check the equipment. Yeah. So I usually look at like, you're going to check the waveform on the alarm. If it's, if you're looking at the alarm, that's probably not going to be a test question, but, but yeah, you check, is it placed right? I'm looking to look at my patient. First of all, if they're not cyanotic and they don't look like they're in respiratory distress, Right, I'm going to check my equipment, make sure things are plugged. They didn't come un unhooked from the machine. Um, and then if, but if they, if it's a true like apneic episode or something, then what am I going to do? Sit them up. If they're like, we yeah, can sit them up. Have them, Maybe have them take a deep breath. Yeah, there you go. Take some deep breaths. And remain with them. Yeah. Increase their anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you might have to give them oxygen, you know, depending on the, on the situation. And then um, it also goes over, so like your bronchodilators, right, the, the nebulizers, right, your MDIs and uh, DP, your powdered inhalers, right, so review those, the spacers. Uh, it did talk about fungal infections a little bit. They, it also went over chest physiotherapy, chest PT, so different positions you can go, you can put the patient in and what you're draining, different oxygen therapy delivery systems. I'm pretty sure most everybody's worked with a patient with like at least a nasal cannula or something. So, um, you know, the different delivery systems, different types of suctioning. Um, and to remember when you're suctioning, like I know with a trach, um, with trach suctioning, it's generally no more than 10 seconds because you don't want them to become hypoxic, right? And so if, um, 
what you generally do for a person with a trach is you give them supplemental oxygen prior to suctioning and then you suction. And then depending on how they tolerate it, you might give them um, some oxygen again afterwards. And then nasal and oral and then different um, artificial airways. We didn't really talk about this, but I think everybody pretty much knows what a, a tracheotomy, tracheostomy is. Tracheotomy is the procedure. <clears throat> tracheostomy is, is what you end up with. Um, and so you have different types of um, trach tubes that you can insert. There's also the endotracheal tubes that are going, um, you know, in orally down in, into, you know, to aerate. Um, but you also have things called oral and nasal airways that you can put in to kind of open the mouth up to get the tongue out of the way. So, um, so there's that. And then um, you still can have occlusions or sometimes the patient can actually pull the trach out or pull the airway out. So those are things to, to be looking for. Um, okay, acute infectious respiratory illnesses. Where am I on time? Do, do a couple more and then <clears throat> take a break. So, you know, no, the no tonsillitis and tonsillectomy, things that you're looking for. Um, and what, what's, um, what's one of the big complications after tonsillectomy? Bleeding. Bleeding. And how might I know that my patient might have some bleeding going on? Frequent swallowing. Yeah, frequent Fre swallowing. Yeah, frequent swallowing, right? So if it, it sounds like they're, it, you know, you're listening to them, um, or maybe they're drinking a lot or something like, because they're swallowing a lot. Um, but that would be, hemorrhage would be what you're looking for. Because if I'm looking at my patient, and they're bleeding inside from the surgical site, am I gonna see the blood necessarily? No. No, so, um, right? And if it hurts, then they might not be drinking. So they potentially could be dehydrated. And then um, sometimes you can see post-op infections or even prior to, to the surgery, there can be infections. And then basically I just listed the different um, respiratory illnesses that they talk about. So knowing the difference between those, um, difference between a pneumothorax and a pleural effusion, and then the different croup syndromes, usually there's some kind of question. Um, again, I'm, I don't know for sure, but <clears throat> there's usually one on ep epiglottitis or the um, laryngotracheobronchitis, the LTB. Um, and so I put the four Ds for the epiglottitis with the drooling, and they do that kind of tripod position and the steeple sign on the x-ray. Um, so I just try to put a couple like key points like to remember. And then asthma, different triggers, right? Risk factors, the classifications, different things. Like you guys do, do pretty well with the peak flow meter, the pulmonary function testing. The skin prick is for allergies because if they, sometimes it's an allergic reaction to something triggers it. And then you, you need to know the, the meds. I don't know how well you need to know the meds, but at some point you need to know all the medications. So <clears throat> the difference between a short acting um, beta adrenergic agonist and a long acting beta adrenergic agonist. Um, ipotropium, that's cholinergic antagonist, corticosteroids. Um, do you know what an, uh, what's an example of a leukotriene modifier medication? Singular. Which is also known as Montelukas. Montelukas. Yes, very good. Woohoo! Um, <clears throat> sometimes you'll see chromalin, chromalin sodium, theophylline. Theophylline is like the little granules that you can also pour out, like on pudding or applesauce. And then you have sometimes combination medications and then um, complications when it gets really bad. Let's get through the respiratory, which I think is one or two more slides, and then we'll take a, take a break. So cystic fibrosis, <clears throat> excuse me, physical assessment, how do you know what's, what um, tests do you do? The sweat chloride test, right? You can do pulmonary function tests, the different medications. What does Dornase Alpha do? Why do they need pancreatic enzymes and vitamins? Um, and then it's not, it's a, it's a systemic um, process with cystic fibrosis. So respiratory and GI and endocrine are also, are all involved together. Um, there could be uh, questions about the, um, like you'll do chest PT and um, postural drainage so that there could be something like that as well. Or the vest, you have the vest to do the therapy. Okay, so let's take a like 10 minute break.
and uh, I'm going to get some coffee and then we'll come back and keep moving along. And then let me know if you have questions. Let me know if this is working or not working. I can shift gears or whatever. Let me, let me know. Okay. Bye. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jerrica. <laughs> <laughs> good morning. Sorry. Bye. No, you're good. Yeah, so if anybody's like hanging around like Jerica, you guys can look up the cardiovascular disorders because I didn't like ASD, VSD, all that kind of stuff. I didn't, um, I'll fix the slide later, but if you want to get a jump on it. And we're back. Woohoo. Got my coffee. All right. Any any questions before we move on to cardiovascular stuff? Okay. Hearing no questions. Um Cardiovascular disorder. So what, what are the different types of the trilogy of Fallot? Yep, tetralogy tet 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 of Fallot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was good. Right? And so there, like there's, or tet, tet's the easier way to, to say it. Um, and what else? What are other ones? Atrial septal defect. Yep, ASD. Or VSD. And VSD, right? Transposition of great arteries. Yep, the transposition of the great vessels, great arteries. Coarctation. Coarc, mm-hmm. And so what, what do you think you need to, like what information do you think you need to know then um, about the different cardiovascular disorders. And that would also be like blood, you know, blood pressure issues, um, things like that falling under cardiovascular. Which like was um, cyanosis? Yes. So you want to know which ones are cyanotic and which ones are acyanotic. And what, what, when you do an assessment, what assessment findings if somebody's having a um, difficulty with perfusion? Um. I blue discoloration around the mouth. Mm -hmm. Circumoral cyanosis. Uh huh. Capillary refill. Cap refill. Fast or slow cap refill? Slow. 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 Delayed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe tachycardic. Maybe tachycardic, maybe bradycardic, some change, right? Probably not a regular heart rate. Uh, what about their breathing? Uh, tachypnea? Potentially, yeah. What about, what about blood pressure? Can be low. Could be low, mm-hmm. Could, could be, be high, and in babies, sometimes they have the, um, the hypertension just to keep to keep um, to keep the circulation going. Sometimes they have a ASD or VSD, and it's a good thing because they need the blood because the blood to mix or not mix or move right for the circulation. Um, so, what's some teaching that you think you would have to do with a family? Provide frequent and small um, feedings. Uh huh. Talk about surgeries, possible surgeries. Yes. Right. Prepare them for surgeries. Expectations. Yeah, expect. Yeah. Expected. Mm -hmm. 
So I'll refer you guys back to the, the chapter um, just to review all that. Again, in 70 questions, I don't even know. I mean, I would think they would pick something, at least one question, but I wouldn't even know which one to tell you to lean towards. But if you can recognize it and know, you know, like the interventions, right? You're going to check the pulse oximeter. You're going to check the cap refill, the vital signs, you know, what the patient's going to look like. Um, probably medications, I would think, maybe a DIG question or something. Um, so that would be something to know as well. Um, okay. Hematologic disorders. So, um, Iron deficiency anemia, how you know it's iron deficiency anemia, sickle cell anemia, the different types of crisis that you can have, the vaso-occlusive or sequestration, um, the uh, pain management for that, complications, and then also hemophilia. So the things that you would need to know, different types of hemophilia, what assessment findings, you know, it's the assessment findings, it's the lab test, diagnostics, the nursing care, different medications, um, and then any complications that you could see. And there's always um, client education. So those are really seem to be, seem to me to be the things obviously that they're, that ATI is focusing on, right? Looking at those, those categories. So think about these things in, always in terms of those categories. Okay, I think we start doing questions again. Yay. Yay. Um, acute infectious GI disorders. So we talked about diarrhea, right? We even had an in-class assignment, right? So diarrhea, um, the dehydration, it did review the oral, um, it talked about oral rehydration calculations. It talked about the differences between isotonic, hypertonic, hypotonic. So a nurse is assessing, is assessing a child who has a rotavirus infection, which are expected findings. It should be a select all but apply, my bad. So there's a rotavirus infection, so they obviously didn't get their rotavirus uh, immunization. <laughs> which, by the way, how do you give a rotavirus immunization? Orally. Yep, that's an oral one. So what are, um, what are expected findings for um, rotavirus? Fever, watery stools. Mm -hmm. Vomiting. Yeah, vomiting. ABC. ABC, yeah, not D or E. Watery stools. Um, I think, yeah, I was trying to think. I can't remember, <laughs> but that sounds right. It's not bloody stools because there's, there's not necessarily blood. Um, and how are you going to know that a four month old is confused? You're not going to know that. And then if they have an infection, you're gonna have a fever, um, definitely the watery stools. And again, these are like, it's not C. diff, but they're having a lot of stools. And then eventually it just turns into watery. And so what's the, what's the side effect? What's a, a complication of diarrhea? Dehydration. Dehydration, right? So yeah, so watery stools, I'd go with A, B, and C. Then all the different, yay, um, GI structural disorders, the cleft lip and palate, GERD. Um, they added in Meckel's diverticulum, which we didn't really talk about, um, but it's sort of, I almost think of it kind of like appendicitis because it's, it's a little outpouching of the small intestine and they just go in and do a laparoscopic removal. So that's a, you know, pre-op, post-op procedures. Um, bloody stools is the assessment data that you're going to see, right? Blood in the stool, not, not a good thing. Um, pyloric stenosis, the differences between Hirschsprungs and intussusception, follow-up care for that, and then appendicitis, um, like ruptured appendix versus non-ruptured. If it's ruptured, if the appendix is ruptured, what are you worried about? Sepsis. Mm-hmm. And what, like, like peritonitis? Yes. Yeah. That would be the complication, right? Itis is an inflammation infection. Uh, so you got the red current, you got the ribbon-like, so you got those, those main things. Okay. Um, and uneresis and urinary tract inf uh, infection. So there's a definition for what aneurysis is. Um, how you, you know, assessments, different nursing care that you could do, different medications. Um, so 
two times a week for at least three months in a child over five. Um, primaries never um, has always been a bedwetter and secondary they started after being trained. Um, and then urinary tract infections, I think we've gone over that a, a lot. Um, different types, what can happen as a result, different labs that you're going to do, different antibiotics, the different classifications you might see, and then complications that you'll get um, from that. What's your, what's urosepsis? Anybody? Infection, urine infection. Right, but it's, it's, it starts that way, but then it, it's the it takes over your entire body. Like you become deathly ill as a result. So yes, it, it's a UTI gone way bad. Um, and who was I talking to? Um, oh, I was talking to, I think she'll, she should be fine with this. I was talking to Ms. Sutliff and her father was in the hospital and she thought he was exhibiting signs of urosepsis, blood pressure and heart rate and some uh, to the mental confusion, that kind of, some of those kind of things. Um, okay, structural disorders. So this was all the hypospadias, epispadias, phimos phimosis, the testicular torsion, um, usually surgical, uh, surgical, you know, procedures to help fix that, um, infections, emotional issues. So the nurse is caring for an infant, here's another question, who has ambiguous genitalia. Which actions should the nurse take? This is a select all that apply. I don't know why B is there twice, sorry. So they have ambiguous genitalia. Uh, maybe B? because you don't know, um, we need to check the adrenal glands. Maybe. A. A, yeah, A, why A? I said D. <laughs> well, it's just as looked all that apply. So D, for sure, right? You're gonna refer the family for genetic counseling which means that you're also going to do blood work for the well, of, of the choices that are there of the A, B, C, D, E. E. Explain E. Yes. E. Right. So if you're going to do E, you're going to do D. If you're going to do D, you're going to do E. So D and E for sure are there. Do we need to cover the genitals? No. no. Um, and actually the adrenal function is, um, uh, I'm trying to think, would not necessarily be one that you would do because it's just looking at the, um, at the, at the genitalia. So things that you would do. So it would be preparing them for surgery. This question was kind of odd because I'm thinking, I don't think prepare the child for surgery is the first thing I would think of. Um, you know, it seems like it's urgent, right? When you say prepare them for surgery. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. And that was kind of, um, how I read the question, but the, which is why again, ATI, I, I, I'm, I'm like, don't be so tricky. Um, but eventually there's probably going to be surgery depending on how ambiguous or what, you know, what the genitalia actually look like, the parent may opt to not have the child have surgery. So that was, that kind of was throwing me a little bit, but you would, the, the correct answer is prepare them for surgery and refer them for, um, the genetic counseling and the chromosomal analysis. And then again, remembering the renal disorders, right? We talked about glomerulonephritis. We talked about nephrotic syndrome. You guys had that assignment. Um, ASO titer is usually something they might ask about. Um, the different labs that you need to do. You have to know your um, you know, Lasix and prednisone, right? Your diuretics, your corticosteroids. There's also something called hemolytic ure uremic syndrome, um, where the kidneys get clogged um, because the RBCs break down and kind of clump. Um, and then the differences between acute renal failure, the pre-renal, renal, post-renal, post -renal, 
and then the different medications um, and sometimes nutrition. I think you guys were saying they threw in a lot of nutrition questions or nutrition type questions on the maternal newborn. So it, um, you know, for a renal diet, you know, knowing do you want potassium foods, sodium foods, phosphate, you know, what combination um, do you want? Okay, fractures, ooh, fun. Um, different types, you need to know the different types of fractures. Again, the neuro assessment, it gives you a nice breakdown of the neuro assessment and the CSM doing your uh, circulation sensation motion checks. Different medications, analgesics, the tetanus, um, again, antibiotics, and then knowing um, traction care, the different types of traction and care involved, and then um, rec being able to recognize compartment syndrome knowing that osteomyelitis is a, is a complication. So the nurse is caring for a child in a plaster spica cast. Which action should the nurse take? Do y'all know what a spica cast is? No. No. So there is a picture in your book. It's the cast that goes like from their, um, their chest down over each leg, but there's an opening so they can pee and poop. Okay. Okay, so it's usually for a child with what disorder? Hip dysplasia? A hip dysplasia, yes. So a spica cast is something that if you hear the word spica cast, you should get this picture in your mind of a spica cast. Right? So if you if you don't have that picture, look it up online, look it in the book, look at it in the book. Because they can't move. They're in a cast. It usually goes down to the well, at least past the knees, it could go all the way down, down further, um, but it's keeping the hips in place because they've put the, the femoral head back where it belongs and now we're, we're leaving it there. So a nurse is caring for a child in the spica cast and it, and it tells you it's plaster, right? So what's, what's, do you know what plaster is? Yeah. Like yeah, a, it's like a clay, not clay, like a Like a cast, kind? right? Like, like an arm chest. cast, you know? It's yeah. like, yeah. Is it's it hard? Is it hard or soft? It's hard. It's hard, right? So, so just even not looking at the answer choices, I'm thinking in my mind I should have a picture of it, what a spica cast is, plaster, that's sort of a hard, hard kind of substance. And so what action, you have to choose one, it's not a select all that apply. You can use a heat lamp to facilitate drying, avoid turning the child until the cast is dry, assist the client with crutch walking, um, or apply moleskin to the edges of the cast. D. D? Do you guys know what moleskin is? Yeah. I'm, not sure every, I'm not sure everybody might, because I worry about some people sometimes not knowing what the words mean. It's like right? something that you put like to prevent, like when you even have a blister, you put it on and it just helps mm -hmm. it heal. And it's, it's nice and soft on the one side and then it's sticky on the, on yeah. the other side. So, um, so you're not gonna, we're not even worried about the cast drying because that's gonna happen and then we're gonna, it's gonna take a while. Um, but you don't even, you don't turn them. You have to like log roll or lift and they're pretty much, they can't sit, right? They're in this position. Um, they're not going to be crutch walking. So you kind of could get it down to, to a couple choices. Um, I'm trying to come at the questions like if you had no idea what it was asking, could you, would you be able to get it down to two choices? But the mole skin to the edges of the cast is the correct answer um, for the skin integrity, right? So they don't have issues. Um, issues there. Okay, then we have a child, a nurse is caring for a child who's in skeletal traction. Which of the actions should the nurse take? This is a select all that apply. So we, we covered skeletal traction a little bit. C for sure, because I remember the pins can get infected. Mm-hmm. B as well. I'm sorry, which one? B as in boy? B. Yeah. And you don't touch the weights. You don't touch the weights. So we have A, B, and C. And what do you guys D. think about D or E? I think D. D is in dog. D, Desiree. Hey, Desiree. Yeah. Desiree says D. So that so the correct answer is A B C D. So if you if you think about traction, 
um, and you have weights hanging, you want to make sure they're hanging freely or otherwise there's no traction. And if you remove the weights to reposition the client, then there's no traction. Right, so that's why that's why that has to, to take place. And yes, you have the pin care, the pin sites. Um, you still have to change their position, but you're going to use wedges or different things to get them off their off their butt. And depending on you know the traction, to improve the skin integrity. Nice job. Okay, musculoskeletal congenital. Right, again, the same. The club foot. The um, necrosis of the femoral head, the leg, leg calperthes disease, the hip dysplasia we just talked about. So the hip dysplasia, once they're over six months old is when you can get the hip spica cast. If they're zero to six months, it's called a pavlik harness. And it looks like it, it looks like the same thing, but it's not a cast. It's like a harness. And then it keeps the, um, it goes under the thighs and it keeps them in that same type of um, position. Same, same complications, immobilization, the skin integrity, infection, um, osteogenesis imperfecta, that's a genetic um, illness where the bones break very easily. Pomidronate's the drug you give for that, scoliosis screening. Um, there could be questions on like the, like they'll put them in a brace, like a, um, to keep the, to get the spine to straighten or a spinal fusion. So that you could get a pre or post-op question about spinal fusions. Again, neuromuscular. We talked a lot about um, the cerebral palsy and the different, um, you know, the care that needs to happen. Spina bifida, we talked about the different types, what you have to do um, when the baby's born, um, arthritis and the muscular dystrophy. What, um, when you have a, when you have a child with a muscular with muscular dystrophy, what eventually will ha like you're going to be assessing everything, but what eventually um, is a complication that you're most worried about? Their breathing. Right, their breathing, because eventually, in a child with muscular dystrophy, it's going to affect the lungs, and usually that's one of the last things that it affects. Good. Okay. Ooh, skin infections and in infestations. <laughs> um, so it gives you a really nice list or tables in your ATI book about the different bacterial, viral, fungal, the bites, um, skin infestations. There's been several memes floating around on Facebook about scabies versus COVID. I don't know if anybody's seen those. Anybody? Anybody on Facebook or are y'all studying all the time? Yeah, we study all the time. You study yeah, but, all the time. <laughs> yeah, but now I'm going to go and look for those because now I'm curious. Now you're going to look for those. There you go, right? <laughs> There's scabies memes out there with, with, uh, with COVID. Um, and the, th the thing is, is that uh, because you hear scabies, it's, it's like lice. You start scratching and itching everywhere, right? And so you hear scabies and it's like you've got the gown and the gloves, a mask, a hat, the shoe covers, and then like COVID, it's like a mask. <laughs> And that, that was, it's not a funny thing, but it's, it's kind of funny. Um, and then from the infections, from the initial infection, you can get secondary infections. So here's a couple questions. A nurse is caring for a child who has cellulitis on the hand. Which action uh, should the nurse take? Pick one. So let's go back. Do we know what cellulitis is? Kind of. Kind of. Okay. So let's break the word down. If it has itis, then inflammation. Then it's inflammation, inflammation, right? And it's on the hand. Kevin, did you? I don't know. Your name just popped up. So I don't know if you were going to say something. So it's an infection um, on the hand. So maybe they got some, think of a, um, like they got a, a, a bug bite, mosquito bite or whatever, bacterial, uh, you know, a bee sting or something, and then it got infected. And so that they would call that a cellulitis. It's, you know, under the skin and it's an inflammation infection. So of those. Patient who had cellulitis and we did both gave oral antibiotics, well, IV antibiotics. Mm-hmm. 
applied an antifungal to the foot. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Um, I think it's A. It would, for the antifungal, it would depend on what, um, what it looked like. It could potentially be that, but the question isn't telling us that. It's just saying the cellulitis. So A out of those two. Yeah, A. Right? So yeah, the answer would be, um, would be A. I wasn't quite sure what Burroughs solution was, so. Um, oh, aluminum triacetate. Okay, what's it used for? Um, oh, itching. It's for itching, stinging, inflamed skin. So it's more for preventative than a, um, than a solution, you know, than a, a fix. Okay, here we go. Scabies. Nurse is assessing an infant who has scabies. Which findings should the nurse expect? This is a select all that apply. Oh, and that's supposed to be pencil-like marks on the hands. Sorry. Yeah, the pencil-like marks for sure. That one, yes. Okay. Uh, e, pimples on the trunk. Pimples on the trunk, yes. I see the blisters on the soles of the feet. Yes, thank you, Kevin. So B, C, and E are the correct answers. What, um, nits in the hair shaft, nits on the hair shaft? That's a lice. That's lice. Okay. All right, dermatitis and acne. So know the difference between contact, atopic, dermatitis, um, different medications for acne. Nurse is caring for an adolescent who has acne and a prescription for isotretinoin from the dermatologist. Which lab findings should the nurse plan to monitor? We didn't talk about that medication. I had to look it up. I picked the wrong answer when I took it, but it does clearly state it in the, in the ATI book. Is there anything you can immediately, like what would the two choices be that you would be thinking between? A and B. A and B. Thanks, Desiree. Desiree votes for A. I think it's A too. Okay. Yeah, the correct answer is A. Is there a reason why um, you why you thought cholesterol and triglycerides over the uh, BUN and creatinine? Um, I don't remember, but I know that tree um, the tretinoin is also you can also use it on the face. Mm -hmm. Um. But I just remember it uh, like it interferes with like your liver functions. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's great, thank you. Yeah, BN and creatinine is um, like more um, antibiotic type drugs. All right, the nurse is assessing an infant who has eczema. Which findings would the nurse expect to find? Select all that apply. So eczema, people know what eczema is? Unfortunately, yeah. I'm sorry. My granddaughter has it pretty bad, so yeah. It's D for sure, right? Yeah, D for sure. And I think it's. Possible B, papules? Yeah, potentially. Um, what about C? Um, you could. I don't know, I'm sure somebody has the book open. 
I didn't write the answers down. I'm trying to do this off the top of my head. What's keratosis pilaris? The rough bumps on the skin? Yeah, it's, they call it chicken skin. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, which is, I guess, a, a, apparently a normal finding. Um, I tend to not choose answers when I don't even know what the heck it is. Um, but that's not always a, that's just my strategy. That's not like any, <laughs> you know, uh, set in stone kind of strategy, but um, you're going to have generalized distribution of the lesions. Generally, I mean, it's going to be arms, leg, legs, it's generalized distribution. Um, you're going to have the crusting lesions uh, and that you get the, there could be bruising um, in the flex areas because that's a lot of times where you'll see it as well is, is where your arms or legs, you know, bend. Um, Papules, I honestly, I don't know if somebody has the book, let me know. I can't remember papules or not because papules are more um, like blisters, kind of like is how I think of it. The book says yes. It says yes, thank you. So A, B, what did the book say? <clears throat> A, B, D. A, B, D, so not the ecchymosis. Okay, thank you. Keep me honest because like I said, I didn't write these down. I'm doing this off the top of my head. So. So ABD. Okay, next one, burns. So we spent a little time on, a little bit of time on burns. There's a PowerPoint on it. Um, generally what the, what they want to know is like the total body surface area, that's TBSA, the different stages, is it minor, major, um, the different types of medication that there's, there are topical medications, also um, pain medications, antibiotics different wound care like um, the debridement or hydrotherapy. They also had a nice listing of the different types of grafts because you're going to do some skin grafting, some that kind of just keeps it together. There can be mesh grafting. Um, mul it's usually multiple grafts that you're doing. Um, burns are very, very painful. So if they're doing the debridement, that's when you would use the morphine um, and more than likely fentanyl and propofol. Um, NO is nitrous oxide. Um, that's another good one. Um, they actually have for kids, they have fentanyl lollipops. Um, so that's kind of, kind of cool, I thought. Um, but wound infection, sepsis, respiratory, especially depending on where the burn is, was there, um, in, in, was there inhalation injury, that kind of thing. So here's a question. The nurse is caring for a client who has major burns uh, and suspected septic shock. So which findings are consistent with septic shock? So this question is, is in the burn section, but it's asking you about septic shock. And it's a select all that apply. E, decrease urine output. Decrease urine output, yep. Altered, e. altered um, level, like the level of consciousness. Yeah, sensorium would be level of consciousness. Well, that one to an increased body temp. Right. There's one more. Somebody. Decreased cap refill time. Yeah. Because what does that have to do with? Dehydration. Like dehydration, the um, perfusion, poor perfusion, yeah. right? Yeah. So bowel sounds don't have anything to do with it. So A, B, C, and D. Wouldn't be. It's actually increased it? cap refill. Yeah. Increase. Oh, you know what? I did the same thing. I keep, keep thinking decrease. <laughs> Thank you, Jerica. See, I did the same thing. So decreased, when I hear decreased, I keep thinking it takes longer, but it's increased cap refill time because that's what takes longer. Right, so so that yeah, I remember. Right. Do, does that make sense? Because I thank you, Jerica. Because I made the same mistake last night. Right, so that's how why you have to read and really think what it is. Because decrease cap refill time would actually be faster. Right, refill time. Yeah. Yes. That means if it's decreased capillary so, refill time. Yeah, that means it would be. Yes. Um, yeah, and it's not. It's slow refill time is what we want because there's poor perfusion. So I apologize. 
So A, B, and D, correct, Jerrica? A, B, and D? Yeah, thank you. Let's see what I mean when you have to read your choices, because <laughs> that'll, that'll get you. All right, nurses caring for a client who has a superficial partial thickness burn. Which action should the nurse take? Can you take, can you take any uh, options away right away because it's a superficial? Uh, you take away C. You can take away C. And D. B as in boy or D as in dog? D as in dog. D as in dog. You can take C and D away. I would say B. Um, so again, it's superficial. Yeah. Partial thickness. So the correct answer is B as in boy. Yeah. Okay, so when they talk about diabetes, we're going to move on to endocrine. They're talking about type 1. I didn't see anything about type 2 in there. That doesn't mean they couldn't ask you about type 2, um, but the chapter in ATI was, was basically type 1. So for sure, you need to know signs and symptoms of hypo and hyperglycemia and what you would do for that. Um, the different lab tests, um, the different types of insulin. So, you know, the fast acting, the, you know, your Lantus, your you need to know which ones you're going to give, your basal, your correction, um, and also DKA, the complication of, of DKA. So again, basically review, but you know, it's difficult to remember everything. Um, so the nurse is teaching a child who has type 1 diabetes mellitus about self-care, which statement by the child indicates understanding, right? Because again, these are questions understanding or needs more teaching. Right, you have to figure that out. So and it indicates understanding of teaching, of the teaching. I should skip breakfast when I'm not hungry. I should increase my insulin with exercise. I should drink a glass of milk when I'm feeling irritable. I should draw up the NPH insulin into the syringe before the regular insulin, which why we still have questions on that, I don't know, but. I would go with C, the drink a glass of milk when he's feeling irritable because um, I think irritability is a side, of, side effect of um, low blood sugar. That sounds good. What do other people think? I agree with that. I agree with the milk too because doesn't the, oh wait, yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you just look in the book? <laughs> no, I just, I'm reading the question again just to make sure, but yeah, yep. I agree with that. So are you going to have them skip breakfast? No. No. What happens if you give, if they give themselves more insulin with exercise? The sugar is going to drop more. The sugar, the sugar is going to drop more, right? Because exercise drops your sugar and then you're mm -hmm. giving insulin. So, so it's not A or B. So milk is a thing. And then D um, we, don't we don't necessarily do that anymore, but you do clear to cloudy. And so it's actually regular and then the um, NPH. So C would be the correct answer. What was the question asking you? What did the question want to know you, know you know? The child knows how to self-care with, 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 uh, with, with his condition? Um, yes, but even more specifically than that. Understanding how how to treat hypoglycemia? How to recognize and treat hypoglycemia. Because the glass of milk, doesn't that provide like sugar for him? Mm -hmm. So I remember reading in the book somewhere about it, like being like a slow, consistent, like delivery of. Right, exactly. Because it's not, um, a lot of times we'll do um, graham crackers with milk because you get a little fast carb and then a long acting carb. The milk, you know, the milk will carry it out a little longer. But that's really what the question was asking. Can you recognize hypoglycemia and what you should do for it? That's what I say when I say, what is the question asking you? That's really what the question was asking you. Sometimes that helps when you're trying to figure out how to answer it. 
Okay, so growth hormone deficiency. Um, I just did questions. You can read on it in ATI. The parent of a school-aged child who has growth hormone deficiency asks the nurse how long the child will need to take injections for growth delay. Which response should the nurse make? So if you know nothing about growth hormone, it says there is a growth hormone deficiency. So what do you think that means? Small kid. Small kid, right? Because if you have adequate growth hormone, you're growing like you should be. If you have a deficiency of it, you're not growing. So potentially a, a small kid. So what do you think about injections to help with that? You would think about like when a girl stops growing more or less and when a boy stops growing, like that could help you answer the question. It could help you answer the question. You you're, want you're them to the grow a certain amount? I'm sorry, say that again, Daniel. Do you want them to grow a certain amount? Yes, it actually, so, so it doesn't have to be throughout the child's life because there's, there's, the growth is gonna stop puberty and all that's gonna happen. So D is not correct. And the fifth percentile, who knows what, they may not even be in the fifth percentile. Just because it's a growth hormone deficiency doesn't mean they're in the fifth or below the fifth percentile. Then I didn't spell that right either, did I? Um, so we can take B and D out, okay? Which leaves us now with Daniel's and Sonia's choices of um, continued until age 10 or 12, or might be stopped once your child grows less than one inch per year. So between A and C, what would you think? As everybody quickly runs to their book. If we do it at age 10 or 12, do we know for sure that the growth has, has stopped? The, that No. No, they can probably still keep growing. Right. So what would be the more accurate answer? So C. So C. Because they might be stopped. It depends, right? The child grows less than one, one inch per year. They're going to keep Because it's measurable. Yes. Okay. Woo. All right. A nurse is assessing a child who has short stature, which finding would indicate a growth hormone deficiency. So people could just be short or you know, there could be genetic components, but what, what finding for a person who has short stature would indicate growth hormone deficiency? E? Excuse me as I drink my coffee. I'm sorry, Bridget, what? D as in dog, the as early in dog. Dirty? Um, no, that is not correct, but it's a good guess. Nope. No. Maybe C. What does this question mean by oversized jaw? It's A. Like a like a big jaw. I think it's A. A. So why would so why would it be A? What leads you to think that? You're correct. Because it's proportional, right? Yeah. They look normal, they're just short. So there's something going on with the growth hormone deficiency because they're not the correct height they're supposed to be. Like um, early onset puberty or um, oversized jaw are, would actually be like an acromegaly or like an over, oh, okay. overabundance. Okay, immunizations. So you gotta look at the tables. They generally ask you, it's either an infant, well, I mean, I can't even tell you that, infant, toddler, could be an adolescent, um, a lot of four-year-olds, a lot of adolescent ones. So you just kind of have to do the best you can with, with knowing those. Um, nurses preparing to administer the varicella vaccine to an adolescent. Which question should the nurse ask to determine whether there's a contraindication to administering the vaccine? Oh, 
Well, I say it's an egg allergy. A. So I have an A. C. I have a C. Bless you, who was ever child just sneezed. I'll go D for Daniel. <laughs> so what do you know about the varicella? What's the varicella vaccine for? Chickenpox. Chickenpox. Chicken and we said that varicella and MMR are different than the other ones, like a Tdap and Hep B. Mm -hmm. Because they're, and we give them sub Q and they're kept in the refrigerator. Because why? Because they're live. They're live. They're live. They're live, live yeast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, 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 I see that. However, there is a. I don't know. Eggs. eggs. So is when when is the allergy to eggs? When do you ask that question? What that's what, for the flu. That is for the flu. So A is not the correct answer. This is a live virus. Live vaccine. Uh, C. C. Thank you, Ray Ray. Because why? Makes you prone to infection. Right. Corticosteroids decrease your immune response. And so now we're going to give a, a live vac vaccine to somebody with a, a low immune response? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Did I lose you guys? I, th I think, I think that the, the, plus they put eggs at the top. And so that kind of threw me initially. I'm like, oh, yeah, eggs. I'm like, oh, crap. No, that's flu. Not, <laughs> not varicella. So the answer they're looking for is the corticosteroid C. Okay, nurses planning to administer recommended immunizations to a four-year-old. Which vaccine should the nurse plan to give? I'll just move to the next question. No, which? <laughs> <laughs> and Jerick is going to have to help me out on this because I just drew a blank. So it's um, IPV, MMR, varicella, and DTAP. Or Rosa's going to give me the answer. Thank you, Rosa. <laughs> Hold on one second. I oh, said, yeah. Answer. <laughs> no, I was just reading Hope had a quant. Like, you have to read all the answers, right? So I think that was from the previous, uh, yeah, from the previous question, right? You can't see allergy to eggs and then stop reading. You have to read through everything, right? And so, for, like I said, four-year-old, you just have to know. If Generally, if you're giving an MMR, you're giving the varicella. Or if you're giving the varicella, you're giving the MMR. So those generally will go together. And then polio, you get a booster at the four-year-old. The DTAP, I think, is the fifth DTAP. Yes. So, right? Yes. And, and did I miss one? Oh, that's right. You're the immunization queen. I forgot about that. You, you know all that stuff. So remind us again. A? It's um, IPV. Yep. MMR. Mm -hmm. Varicella. And DTAP. Mm -hmm. And DTAP. Sounds good. It could also help you to remember that they're turning four, so you're giving four. Ooh, I like that. Whatever it takes, whatever helps you remember. So communicable diseases, um, again, there is a long list in your book, so I didn't list them all. Um, different medications that you can use, types of isolation precautions, right? I think you got a question on the maternal newborn about um, about C. diff. I think the mom maybe had C. diff. I don't know if that was what the question was exactly, but it's like, well, we didn't talk about C. diff. You know, well, we did. We talked about it in first semester. We're just giving it to a maternal, a mom now. So this could, you know, communicable diseases, there could be a question about types of isolation precautions. So a nurse is teaching a group of family members about communicable diseases, like measles, mumps, chicken pox, that kind of thing. Nurse should include that which is the best method to prevent a communicable disease. Read all your choices, please. D. What do y'all want to answer initially? A. A, hand washing. <laughs> right, because we drill that into you, hand washing, hand washing. But this is a communicable disease. And so obtaining immunizations, prevention, right, because this is the best, me 
best method to prevent a communicable disease? So the correct answer is D as in dog. Okay, otitis media, why it gets its own chapter? I have no idea. So what's the initials AOM? I just, we just said it, acute, acute, acute otitis, otitis, otitis media. media. What's O-M-E? Otitis media. With? Effusion. Effusion, right? So what does that mean? What's the difference? Flu effusion means there's fluid. fluid in the yes, air. yes. So you have to know that difference. Um, different uh, medications, they can do, what's a myringotomy? That's ear tubes, right? You pl they place ear tubes, that's a same day surgery. Um, but if you don't get the ear tubes, there can be hearing loss, speech delays, all kinds of stuff. So a nurse is caring for a toddler who has had three ear infections in the past five months, for which long-term complication is the child at risk? Speech delay. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, wait. So, so we can get rid of A and B. We're down to our two, right? C and D. But we're talking about a long-term complication. Speech delay. So speech delay, mm -hmm. right? Mastoiditis, yes, there could be an infection, um, you know, but that we can get rid of that. Speech delay, that's can be a long, that's long-term, right? It's gonna, they're gonna have to go to speech therapy and it can, it can be an issue. So the key there is long-term and that would be a speech delay. Um, we did not go over, I didn't even touch on HIV AIDS in children. Um, that's why it's in green and not black. Um, so, you know, the different medications, different categories and classifications, there's tables in that chapter, um, the different complications. But again, we've talked about failure to thrive and we've talked about uh, pneumonia. So, here we go, we're talking about AIDS and we're gonna talk about uh, isolation precautions. They're, you're caring for a child who has AIDS, which isolation precaution should the nurse implement? Read all your choices. Standard. What's your first instinct? Contact. Contact. Yep, Contact. but it's not, it's standard. Um, and I don't, I don't know if any of you were, well, I know many of you were around in the 80s, but in, in healthcare, um, we were using all kinds of precautions until we figured out that really we only needed to use standard precautions. And that was a, that was a whole, that's a whole nother lecture and story, right? But there, there it is. Read all your choices, right? And here's PPE coming in. Um, so the, um, the neoplasms now, the cancer, I refer you back to Ms. Sherbeamer's lecture. She hit all the main, the main points there. Um, your book divides it into different sections. So organ neoplasms, you know, Wilms tumor, tumor um, neuroblastomas, chemo, the side effects of chemo. Um, and so you're caring for a child who's post-op following the surgical remover of a Wilms tumor, which assessment is an indication to continue NPO status. Oh my gosh, that doesn't even have to do with Wilms tumor, but it's in the Wilms tumor category, right? So it wa it's wanting to know what's the indication to continue NPO status. C. C. Yeah, C. 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 Yep. So one centimeter is not that bad. Um, pain doesn't really have anything to do with it. And if I'm passing gas, I'm good. But if I have absent bowel sounds, we're going to stay NPO. Right? So those are the first, for me, those are the frustrating questions. It's like, wait, I know not to touch the abdomen. It's Wilms tumor. But that's not what the question's asking you, right? It's asking you about NPO status. Um, blood neoplasm. So leukemia, complications from that. Um, again, chemotherapy, side effects. Uh, oral mucositis, nurse is caring for a child who has oral mucositis, which action should the nurse take? Select all that apply. Okay. 
Is there anything that you can um, e? delete that you're not going to use? I think A. We're not a? Gonna, you're not going to use A. Mm -hmm. No lidocaine. No, why no lidocaine? Because it's thick or something like that. Yeah, because it's and it, it tells you viscous. Viscous means thick, right? So you might think, oh, lidocaine. Um, um, but yeah, it can. It's thick. It's too thick. It can affect the breathing. Probably use a soft toothbrush because of bleeding. You don't want them because they're. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, so you're going to use a soft brush. You would offer Probably soft offer soft foods. You're going to offer yeah. soft foods. Yes. And they do gargle with warm. They do gargle with yeah. warm saline mouthwash. I had to think twice about that because I'm thinking, oh, salt water, that's going to um, maybe hurt. But I thought too much into the question, right? Because that's what you, you do. Yeah, it sort of dries out the blisters and so forth, right? Is that how mm -hmm. it works? Okay. Yes, yeah, and, it, and it does the warm and the saline kind of helps to bathe yeah. it. Make it does, did you have something, Jerrica? You just keep popping up like you were good. Okay, so C, D, and E. And then the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, bone and soft tissue. So the bone, the osteo, anything with osteo is a bone thing. Anything with sarcoma is a cancer thing. And then rhabdo, um, myo, that has to do with muscle. And then sarcoma is, um, is cancer. So the different um, risk factors, which you're going to see, um, what would... Why would they have amitriptyline um, if they had cancer? Antidepressant? Yeah, it's a tricyclic antidepressant. Yep. Um, and sometimes with the um, uh, bone cancers, you're going to have amputations. And think, you know, it's bad enough when I see adults with diabetes with the amputations. Now there's a child with cancer who has an amputation. Oh my goodness. So the nurse is caring for the child following an above the knee amputation, which action should the nurse take? Choose one. I'm pretty sure it's not B. Is there more than one that could be right, or is it just one? No, not for the top question. The top question is one only. C. Oh, I say C. Yeah. C. But it's above the knee amputation, so I don't know if that is eligible for a prosthetic. So it's only below that it would be eligible? I don't know. I want to say yes, but... But I've seen prosthetics that are above the knee. I don't know. <laughs> So what's the what's really the question looking at? Are are you what what two choices did you get it down to? C and D. Is that most people got it down to C and D? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um because I like C because it prepares them, it gives them almost like I'm looking at the hope thing of you had this done, now let's get you going. Mm -hmm. Get you fitted to keep moving, but I don't know. And Jerrica, I wrote the question correctly, right? It's an above the knee, not a below the knee. I think Jerrica's keeping up with me. Or somebody's keeping up with me. I wrote the question correctly, right? It's an above the knee, not a below the knee. It's above the knee. It is above the knee. Um, but you're not going to leave it in a dependent position. You're going to have it there. It's going to not elevated, but you're going to keep it up. You don't want it all the blood pooling and everything. So yes, you're going to prepare them for a prosthetic fitting. So C is the correct answer. Um, nurses providing home care instructions to a parent of a child receiving chemotherapy. Which instructions should the nurse include in the teaching? This is a select all that apply. <clears throat> so their home care, it's home care for chemotherapy. A, infection, bleeding, and hygiene. Yep. Yep, you got it. I tend to think of that as one of the easier select all that apply <laughs> questions because <laughs> you could just go boom, boom, boom. I know. I hope this is helping doing questions and talking through rationales. It is. 
Um, so complications of infants, this has got to be the longest chapter in the entire book. Um, so I did not go into detail at all, really. Um, PKU, right, phenyl, ketone, PKU, urea. Um, NEC, right, is, um, is what? The abbreviation for what? Absolute neutrophil count. No, that's an ANC. It's a necrotizing. And NEC, yes, ne necrotizing enterocolitis. What's RDS? Respiratory distress syndrome. Yes, respiratory distress. Um, congenital hypothyroidism. Um, and then um, we did, yeah, we went over neonatal abstinence, right? And the um, Finnegan scoring and morphine. We talked about that. Yep. Yep. Um, uh, plagiocephal plagiocephaly. That's like a flat head, like they're in the same position the whole time. We talked about uh, failure to thrive. Uh, newborn seizures, I'm just going to refer you guys back to the, the book, the preterm com complications, we had a lecture on that, um, the chromosomal anomalies, we did also talk about the hyperbilly and newborn sepsis. Uh, I can't remember if I mentioned bronze baby syndrome or not, but if there's too much phototherapy, um, the baby actually starts to turn sort of a bron orange bronze bronze-ish type of color, and that's a bad thing. Um, Nurses assessing a newborn who has congenital hypothyroidism. Which findings should the nurse expect? I think we have five minutes left, so I'm, I'm trying to keep track of the time. So it's a newborn with congenital hypothyroidism. Anybody? Does it matter necessarily that it's a newborn? Like what, what, what do you expect to see in somebody that's hypothyroid? I know several of you out there have hypothyroidism. <laughs> like you're always, you? always cold. Yes, you're always cold, cool extremities. Right, hypothyroidism, everything slows down, right? I'm not sure, but maybe tachycardia? Everything slow. Oh, never mind. Sorry. <laughs> B and C. Yeah, B and C. <laughs> sorry. It's okay. No, it's okay. But that's it. That's what I'm saying. It's like hypo, right? Hypothyroidism. Um, okay. Why, why a short neck? Um. Jerica, I'm going to go back to you, Jerica. <laughs> Help me out here. It doesn't say. <laughs> it doesn't say, right? It just says short it's now. Expected finding. I okay. think it's just, yeah. I think because of the, the growth, and so um, there could be an issue with the thyroid or, you know, they're, depending on what it is, I think it's like a growth thing. It's just something that you expect to see. Okay. I thought maybe I missed a specific thing, but it's just something you're going to see. But you're not going to see tachycardia because that's fast. You're not going to see hyper, anything hyper, right? It's all going to be hypo. Okay, nurses teaching the parent of a newborn how to treat the newborn's plagiocephaly, which statement by the parent indicates an understanding of the teaching. So again, understanding of the teaching, not needing more teaching, but understands. So this is what I call the Sesame Street question, right? One of them is going to be correct, and three of them are going to be incorrect. Which one is not like the others? So the question is saying that they already have it, right? Yes. So it would be the C? C. Are you, are you, yeah, it is, the correct answer is C. Are you ever going to put the baby to sleep on its belly? No. Ever? No. To sleep. Right, and you're, you're correct to sleep, right? You're gonna do belly time, yeah, tummy time. Um, ensure the baby's head is in the same position? No, that's what causes no. place, right? Um, and then allow the baby to sleep in an infant swing? Again, no. the head is in the same place. You're not going to do that. And actually what they do is they, um, there is a helmet that they wear. It's worn 23 hours a day or as much as you can get them to wear it. Um, and actually one of my friend's babies had that. They adopted. Um, uh, a baby boy who, and he had this because um, he had been left on his back, like 
that's kind of why he was up for adoption because of neglect. Um, and they made it um, like an R2D2 or no, um, the Bebo, what, you know, like they put stickers on the helmet. It was really cool. And he doesn't have to wear it anymore, like a year, maybe. Um, pediatric emergencies. Again, we had a little bit of, of lecture on this. Respiratory, you know, it's the same things. Apnea, obstruction, right? The drowning, the submerging. Uh, ATI still uses the term um, apparent life-threatening event, not the brief unexplained, uh, resolved unexplained event. Um, SIDS, back to sleep. Poisoning, so poisoning, we didn't go over a whole lot. Um, you need to know like the difference between, um, like if there's an OD on Tylenol, aspirin, iron, um, if it's corrosive, like what you need to do. When do you pump the stomach or when do you give charcoal or when do you do those kind of things? So you, you, it would behoove you to look at that. Um, the nurse in a community center providing an in-service to group of parents on management of airway obstructions in toddlers. Which responses by one of the caregivers indicates understanding of the teaching? This is a select all that apply. And I believe this will be our last question. And what is this question wanting you to know? What is it asking you? That we understand what to do. When um, a child is choking? Yes! Back to CPR. C, B, A. So I have an A and a C. Anything else? I can't read the whole thing for. Oh, sorry. E is. Can you read D? D is I will use my finger to check my child's mouth for objects. We don't do that. No, yeah, don't. That. And no. E is I will place my child in in my oh in my care ha, in my car and drive to the closest ER. I think C. So there's more than one. So C. So C and and depending on. I would say it's an airway obstruction. So I would say A as well. A and C. The question wants to know, do you know what to do when the kid is choking or when there's an airway, they've swallowed a quarter or something, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's a, it's a CPR question. It's a CPR mm -hmm. question. All right, you guys did, oh good, we did make it to the end. There's one more slide there. Um, so I'll go back and fix some of the things in there and um, the answers are in your ATI book, so you can look those up as well. Um, any questions? I hope that was helpful to go through the thought process. Um, any it questions very on anything or? I still have a question. Yeah. Um, but it's pertaining to the ATI again. Okay. So um, I don't know if, um, because the way that Liz showed me, um, we just was um, texting back and forth. Yeah. That's the, that's the um, improvement for the practice testing. It's not the improvement for the proctored testing. So I don't know if that's what you guys want is the improvement for the practice test. I thought it was the improvement for the proctored testing that you wanted us to show proof of. Yes. Is it, can somebody speak to that? Are so you trying, I think you know, because I've already submitted my pay, my you're paper yeah, that's fine with Miss Clark, but Miss Clark, I don't know if she needs to communicate with you or you need to communicate with her about maybe accepting the picture because I think she thinks that there's something else other than that. Because when I submitted my practice test A, she said that I only had 33 minutes, but the 33 minutes was how long it took me to complete my practice test A. Um, that wasn't the improve hours. So when I submitted the picture of my improve hours, I didn't get a response back from so her. So that could be because we didn't go back to look at it yet. And I can speak to that because I, I just changed it. Because <laughs> I just looked at it just now. <laughs> that's what I thought. Um, and changed it back. Um, and yeah, I can accept the screenshot. That's fine. Um, so I had been grading these through the week. So if you were missing the 10 questions or not the hours or the hours didn't line up to what you scored on ATI, I was giving people feedback. Um, so I just hadn't gotten around to giving you feedback yet, Katrina, but it's okay. updated now. Okay, got it. Okay. I'm just making sure because I didn't, I mean, I don't, all this stuff is changing all the time. So I didn't know if there was something that's different that I needed to do, but 
I'm, I'm literally on this computer 24 seven because I am E with a capital E illiterate. So I'm just trying <laughs> to figure things out. <laughs> No, it's no, it's a good question because it helps everybody understand. I can I can speak for myself when I go through and, and grade things. I I go through once, right? And then I'll give you feedback. Like Ms. Clark is saying, if you're missing the 10 points or you didn't have enough hours or whatever it was, I'll leave you a comment. I might even put a zero so that it clues you to look and see, ooh, what did I do wrong? And there's a comment there. But then I do not go back and recheck it right away you know, until I go do a whole nother batch of grading. And then I go back in and look. And then I'll start, to, like Ms. Clark said, she went in today and, and changed it. So unless you actually like email us, or at least for me, email me to go look again, I'm not gonna look. I'll know you resubmitted because on our end, it will show as blue as a, or a green, blue or green to show that you've submitted something or resubmitted something, but we don't live in the grade book. So, you know, just be patient and we eventually will um, we'll get around to it. And if we don't, then let us, let us know, shoot us a message. So it's easier to do an email as opposed to like a comment on the uh, grading area? Yeah, because we won't see the comment in the grading area unless we go back in to grade it again. Okay. And I'll just say for the grading part is if you submit something and we give you a comment, give us at least a day before you're blowing up our email to ask for like what has happened. I know you guys are really wanting every point you can, but I'm not in, I'm grading once and then I may not get back to it till the next day. So if mm -hmm. you email me, I mean, unless it's super urgent that like it's, you got a zero and you're turning your, and it's worth 20 points and you're really worried, give us a day to get back in that grade book before you give us an email, I think. Mm -hmm. from my perspective is what I would want. Okay. Yeah. Don't worry. You just we're grading, you know. we're grading clinical, we're grading yeah. CRS. There's a lot of things that we're trying to keep up with just as, as you are. So, um, but we, we know it's important to you. So yeah, just be patient. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. And a screenshot is fine. That works for us as well. Um, do you, um, do you guys want to take a break and then come back at 1030 for the CRS? Well, not, but like go to the new Zoom meeting in CRS. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's do that. Let's take a break, get more coffee um, and then go, I'm going to close this Zoom room. So you're going to go to the new one that's in CRS for CRS. Ms. Sillinger? Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, yes. ATI, if you could just kind of explain it to me because I'm just having a hard time understanding or for the artificial air, um, airway, it's uh -huh. safe, um, under the complications for the accidental decannulation. Mm -hmm. It says that, um, um, that in the first 72 hours, it's an emergency because if it does get removed, um, the, tr the track, the tracheostomy track hasn't been matured and replacement mm -hmm. could be difficult. So I'm right. just having a difficult time understanding that because I would, in my head, I would assume that it would just be easier because it was just recently done, so it would be easy to insert, but I guess it's wrong. Oh, okay. Can you so, yep. So when you um, initially do, so the tracheotomy is the procedure, and then the tracheostomy is the whole, you know, afterwards. And so when they go in to make the hole, they, um, they and then you put the, the trach tube in, um, it, it in and of itself is um, like healing. It's got to heal. So if the um, trach ties come loose or like we don't even change anything really uh, immediately after surgery, we're going to change the, the gauze underneath, but we're not going to change, you know, we're not going to change the trach out. We're not going to do anything to it so that it can heal. If it comes out, what happens is the skin involutes on you know on itself so it's very difficult to to reinsert even with an obturator to reinsert it back in you can you can do it you've got to do something um but it can tear the skin up and make things worse but after it's healed after i don't know whatever the book says three to five seven days whatever then if it comes out it's a lot easier to to reinsert okay thank you does that make sense yes yes thank okay. you okay mm-hmm Okay. Um, Mrs. Sellinger, really quick question. <clears throat> yes. Will you be on people, people can leave if if you want or you can whatever you want to do. <laughs> Will you be um, on Cranium Cafe at all today? 
Um, I can be there after CRS. Okay. So like, whatever that is, uh, like after 11 or whenever we're done. Yeah. Okay. Okay. then. I'll so you can pop in. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Nice job. See you later. Okay, thank you, Ms. Longer. Thank you, Rosa. Nice job. Good job, Desiree. Sonia, awesome. Rosa, Amanda. Nice job, Ms. Clark. <laughs> <laughs> that is I always seem to come in at the right time. <laughs> I know. It's just amazing. Your timing is impeccable. Oh. oh. Melina, Amanda. Desiree. Desiree. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. All right, let me stop my recording here. Stop recording. If you want to stop your cloud recording.